This is not an easy chapter. A respected writer says this. This chapter may be treated in Bible classes. We do not see how it could be used for a sermon or sermons. So great. You're probably thinking now, great, why does our preacher think he's something special? Why can he go against this advice? Well, of course, I don't claim to have superior skills. But we do step out in faith in God's promises that all Scripture is God-breathed and all Scripture is profitable, useful for teaching, reproof, correcting, training, and righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. We also step out in faith that all Scripture speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we can't not consider this chapter. To pass over this chapter would be like switching off a movie with half an hour still to go, just as it's reaching its climax. All the plot lines beginning to come together, all the characters together, and the tension being ratcheted up. This, chapter 11, is what we have been building to in the book of Daniel. Of the four visions in the second half of the book, this is the longest and it is the last. So both of those things give it a priority and an importance. Of the four visions, this is the only one delivered, as we said earlier, by Jesus Christ himself. The glorious figure like a son of man. The one who causes fear in Daniel but then speaks comfort to him. And we saw last week, or two weeks ago, in chapter 10, that Even to bring this vision, there had to be a mighty struggle. Chapter 10, verse 12. It comes in response to Daniel praying and fasting for three weeks. Chapter 10, verse 13. uh, The Son of Man speaks of how he was opposed in spiritual warfare. It cost a lot to bring this vision, this chapter, to us. This is the climax of the book. This is what it's been building up to. So we can't skate over it or ignore it. So it might be hard but it is definitely worthwhile. And my prayer is that we'll see that by the end of today and also that it might not be too hard for us. There are two simple lessons in this chapter that are brought to us with power. Jesus Christ is Lord of history and of our suffering. Jesus is Lord of history and of our suffering. And the key to understanding this chapter is understanding that this is Jesus Christ speaking. The description in chapter 10, the voice, the appearance, the clothing, they are divine. And it's the same as the appearance of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. Daniel's response to this figure in chapter 10, falling in fearful reverence, that's a response befitting meeting the glorious Son of Man. The God man. This glorious Son of Man's response to Daniel is the same as Jesus' response to John in Revelation chapter 1. He touches him to strengthen him and he speaks his word to him to comfort him. And so the point is the key to understanding this chapter is that this is a message of the Lord Jesus Christ to his people and for his people. He speaks in all of God's word. But he is speaking particularly in this part. We could say that. Or he's speaking more directly in this part. At the climax, at the end of the book of Daniel. And a simple message. Jesus Christ is Lord. First of all, we want to see how Jesus is Lord of history. Jesus is Lord of history. There are many things in Daniel that scholars disagree on. There tends to be a big divide between liberal scholars and conservative scholars. Liberals take one view of who wrote the book, when it was written, when the visions happened, when they described, and conservative scholars tend to take another view. But nearly everybody, despite the vast divide in them, is agreed that chapter 11 is a detailed description of events in the 500 years Before Jesus Christ. Everybody agrees that that is what is being described. Where they differ, where they disagree is over when it was written. Was it before these things happened? By Daniel himself? Or was it after or during these things happening? It's so detailed and so specific 
that many simply assume it must have been written at the time these events were happening or afterwards. They look at it and say, this cannot be prophecy. But accurate prophecy is only a problem if you have a problem with a God who knows all things and controls all things. We, as believers in God's word, have no problem believing that about God. And so the fact that there are detailed, specific prophecies here, they're no problem to us. But for many, they simply just, they can't get past that. They don't believe in a God who does miracles. They don't believe in the supernatural. And so this must have been written afterwards because it is so specific and detailed. There are four main chunks in it. They start small in length, covering many years, And then they get longer in length in terms of words, and they cover less years. The vision gets more specific and more detailed as it goes on. It's giving us detailed descriptions of events in the 500 years before Jesus. This is what is happening in the chapter. So these four chunks, verse 2 speaks about the Persian Empire, of which Daniel is now part of in the first year of Cyrus This empire has taken over. And it speaks, verse 2, of a vastly wealthy fourth king of the Persian Empire who would attack Greece. And that's referring to King Xerxes, the husband of Esther, known as Ahasuerus in our Bibles. And he attacked Greece famously in 480 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae and Sardis, I think. Well-known events to those who know the history. Persian Empire, verse 2. Verses 3 and 4, as I mentioned to the boys and girls, the Greek Empire We're told that a mighty king will do as he pleases, but will suddenly be broken. Alexander the Great, conquering the entire world in 10 years, dying at the age of 32 in 323 BC. His empire uh, broken up and divided into four amongst his generals, not his sons, not his descendants. And it's helpful uh, to realize verses 2 to 4, the Persian and the Greek empire, they cover the same time period as chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the goat. The third chunk is from verse 5 through to verse 20, and it describes conflict between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And then the last section is verses 21 to 35, zooming in particularly on one king of the north. Now, I want to minimize the amount of history that I give here. I, I could go through it in detail and show how each verse has been remarkably fulfilled But most of us, myself included, we're not familiar with this time period. And I think to do so would simply leave a fog of Ptolemy, Seleucids and Antiochus. Sounds like a bunch of flowers, doesn't it? And we just would be left with a bit of a fog. So I'm going to sketch out the bare minimum of this. First of all, Alexander the Great conquers the known world. He dies young with no obvious successor. His generals grab power and split his empire up four ways. And the the four empires are are, uh, on that map. doesn't uh, matter greatly for you to, to know that. But there are two main empires that come out of Alexander the Great in Greece. Two main ones that come out of the four. The Seleucids, who rule over Syria, uh, at the top there in the green, Syria and Babylon. And then the Ptolemies in the south ruling over Egypt. And these two kingdoms are known as the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south in Daniel chapter 11. So we're talking about Syria and Egypt, two kingdoms, two empires. And in some ways, that's the first striking thing about Daniel chapter 11. Again and again, these two world empires that ruled for